Well, welcome once again, everyone, to What's Next Beyond Service. This is episode number 35, entitled Own Your Calling. Our guest today is Stephen Nesbitt. Stephen served in the Air Force for 15 years in the SOF community. He's a SOF veteran, and, and more specifically, is U.S. Special Warfare Airman or Pararescuman. So, you know, I, I spent 20 some years in the Marine Corps, and even I didn't know a whole lot about what that community does. And so, you know, I'm sure Stephen's going to share some of that once we start talking uh, about his story. Uh, right now, uh, Stephen is currently serving as the president and co-founder of Shields and Strikes. It's a 501c3 nonprofit, and they're focused on the first responders and veterans space. And we'll get into that here uh, in a moment with Stephen. Uh, Stephen, welcome aboard. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Looking forward yeah, to this. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, Stephen, if, if I recall correctly, and, and I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we were introduced by a, a gentleman um, who, <laughs> getting up in age, sometimes you have, you know, old guy moments. Uh, I, I can't think of his name. Is El Elderman is his last name? Is Lloyd Lloyd Earlman? I call Lloyd, him. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. know that. He, he's a tremendous, he is a good man. Uh, I tell you, he, he is so good at connecting people. You know, he, he sees certain things and he's like, well, let's get these folks together. And, and that's how uh, you and I connected uh, through his reaching out and, and doing just that on LinkedIn. And so we had a, we had a phone call uh, set up. It was actually a, a Zoom call. And I thought it would probably be 20, 30 minutes. And, and it was over an hour and it went by really quick. And you know this it's a good thing when when that happens i i know i can talk a lot too but <laughs> but i think you know we, we we formed a connection there uh i saw the goodness in in, in steven as as a as a person as a man and then absolutely his story and what he's doing now it's intriguing it's compelling and so you know for for my purposes of what i'm doing who better than someone like steven to bring in and, and want to talk about uh you know who he is uh, his story on transitioning from the military, his finding purpose, and then serving the communities that uh, that we love dearly, the folks that we have an affinity for, uh, in folks you know in the military, uh, veterans, and then certainly our first responders. Uh, you know, we would not have the the life that we have in this country if it wasn't for these groups of people that uh, that sacrifice. And then you know come back and continue to serve you know, after they've done their time. So, you know th this is going to be a, a great story, and I'm very happy to to have you aboard here once again, Stephen. So, um, so let's do this. Let's turn now and talk a bit about your why in terms of service. You know what what compelled you to serve to go into the Air Force, and then more specifically the the soft community. Uh, that's a very specialized and uh, very needed component of our armed forces. Uh, yeah, great question. So um, the compel to, to actually join the military is not as, um, I guess, as shiny as you, as, as other people would be. I, I went to high school and I played sports. I played soccer growing up and I played a lot throughout early my childhood and I was, I felt like I was pretty good. I just did not go to a very good high school. And so like nobody was going, no scouts were going to my high school to check us out because we certainly weren't winning any championships. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had, my goal was to go play soccer in college. Um, but I didn't get any scholarships. I didn't have my, I didn't grow up wealthy or, or rich. I also wasn't super poor. I just was right in that middle, lower, middle to lower area um, as far as classes go. And so I ended up going to a community college because, and all my friends went to, went to the U of A. So I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. All my friends went to the U of A for engineering and had all these sponsored or, or scholarships and things like that. Um, very smart individuals. And then it was just me and my, I had a, tw I have a twin brother. Um, we're, we were going to a community college. And when I showed up for class and I'm a space nerd, I liked, I like space um, stuff. And, and so I went for <laughs> astronomy, uh, to get a degree in astronomy and um, learn about that. And as I was sitting in the classrooms looking around, I was like, this is just like high school. 
And uh, I also looked at the people around me and I was like, I'm a lot younger than most of these people that are here. Um, I feel like I had more in my body, my system to, to get out of. I, like I'm, I'm already plugging myself into a, a career field that's not super active. And I was living an active lifestyle. So um, yeah. I was like, I, I don't know what else to do with my life. My dad spent some time in the Air Force. Um, I think I'm just going to go try that. See, I'm going to go talk to him and figure it out. Went to an Air Force recruiter and uh, walked out of that recruiting office, um, having a job picked uh, as a nuclear weapons apprentice. Um, so my, I, I had the plan all in my head. I'm going to, I'm going to go do the, go to the air force for four years, do my time. And then I'm going to get my schooling paid for that way. I'm going to get out. I'm going to get a job at Raytheon or something like that. And then I'm going to join the rest Sounds of like my a great plan. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to join the rest of my buddies in the engineering pack. And we're going to be friends again. Um, and as I stepped out of that office, there was a, an army recruiter next door and he happened to be standing outside watching me walk out of the office and he's like hey buddy let me talk to you and i was like well i'm already good i just talked to the air force she's like you want to be in special forces and i was like oh man that sounds pretty cool and the, well, yeah sure let me let me hear what you have to say <laughs> and uh sat me down he talked to me he pumped me up and uh, i was like okay well let me let me let me come back i'll come back to you i went back into the air force recruiter's office and said hey um do you guys have a special operations career field um, I just talked to those guys. They, they're going to give me $25,000 to be a, a special forces green beret. And, uh, they said, well, the air force recruiter said, yeah, we have air force special operations career fields, but you already chose to be a nuclear weapons apprentice and you also wouldn't make it. It's a 90% oh. attrition rate. You're not going to make it just, just do what you picked. And I was like, oh, this guy, um, <laughs> there's a theme here in this, in that same um, sentiment that I continue to receive throughout my, my whole life, essentially. And um, I asked them to give me a disc of information, got a disc um, about combat controllers and PJs or pararescue, and uh, started to do some of my research. Um, and then that's what kind of got me plugged into, okay, that's what I want to do. And really what I wanted to do was combat control. Um, that's what I picked as my career field. And back then, so this is in 2005, um, they had an indoctrination course and there wasn't a lot of information as far as what the air force recruiters would get. They don't, they didn't know. None of them went through it. Um, I, you have to take a pass test, a physical ability and stamina test. Um, and I thought they were the same, the PJ and the combat controller pass test. Um, mm -hmm. Apparently they're different. And I took the one to be a PJ, um, and I said, I thought I wanted, I thought I was going to be a controller. And the recruiter said, they're the same thing. When you get to basic training, you can, you can figure it out when you get there. It's not a big deal. I was like, Those okay. recruiters are good at that, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I, was like, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, cool. That makes sense. A young 18 year old me. I was like, yeah, sure. This guy would never lie to me. Um, and <laughs> so got back in or got joined and then uh, showed up to basic training and then found out I was actually becoming a PJ and, a, and not a combat controller. <laughs> um, which actually turned out to be a, a better pathway for me um, and who yeah. I was. Um, so that, yeah, that that's kind of what got me into it and, and what compelled me to, to do special operations was because somebody told me that I couldn't do it, um, which again, that's, a, that's been the theme throughout the past 16 years of my life. And even at basic training, as I'm in my basic training uh, course, which there's, it's all the mix of different people going to different career fields, 30, 31 other dudes were going in to become a PJ um, in just in my basic training class alone. And uh, they'd stay up at night and, and do little extra push-ups, extra pull-ups and things like that, calisthenics. Um, and I would go to sleep um, because I was super tired and we had to get up early. And uh, the, the basic training instructor pulled me aside and he's like, hey, you're going to be the first one to quit. You're not going to make it. These other guys are putting in extra work and you're just going to sleep. And I'm like, well, I'm tired. I'm like, all right. Like, I it guess so. Matters, I guess yeah. <laughs> Again, telling me that I'm going to quit. I'm not going to make it. And then started in doc, um, which is our indoctrination course with 120 people. We finished with 12, um, that indoctrination course. And all of those 30 other people that were in the basic training class quit. Um, with those other 108 people 
Um, so I was the only one left out of that basic training class. Um, so again, to say, God, it doesn't really matter what extra stuff you do. It's just what's in your, in your brain. What, what, are you willing to put in the work and not quit? Right. Yeah. Having, having that mindset and, and that heart of a warrior, you know, even though you weren't necessarily a warrior yet, you know, you, you had that baseline, right. And you had that capability or that capacity within you. And it, it is interesting how some folks may use that, you know, as a tool that the comment, oh, well, you're not going to be able to do this. Some folks may be using that as a motivator, but really, when you look at the numbers, they're probably right for a large percentage of the people, you know, because when you look at the attrition rates, they're extremely high, you know, in, in those special ops uh, occupations. And so, I mean, that's incredible. <laughs> you, were the, you, were the, you were the guy left standing in, in the end. That's pretty tough. So there's something also to be said about getting sleep too, right? Because you got to gotta recover uh, physically, mentally, and, and spiritually. You know, those three things are kind of important things for us, um, you know, especially as we, you know, mature and, and get more responsibility in, in our lives and jobs being being fit to uh, to lead. Uh, and, and that's part of it. But so, yeah, hey, real, real quick, one thing you, you talked about, um, you know, growing up, and sports. Uh, this, I, I was an athlete as well. I did football and, and I pole vault in high school. And, you know, so I thought I was going off to college and be a pole vaulter, but some things changed in my life and that's not what happened. And I too went to community college. One of my friends went off to, you know, University of Virginia, Penn State, you know, smart guys, you know, and they've had fantastic lives, you know, and they're, they're my those other two guys are my core, you know, we grew up together and we've remained very good friends. But yeah, I, when you said going to a community college and then looking around and you know, a, lot, a lot of older folks there, I, I, that was like, I went back in time when you said that, because that's exactly right. Because a lot of the folks that were in my classes were people that were working, but then deciding, <laughs> hey, I want to get, you know, uh, an associate's or I, I'm going to try school now. And so, yeah, it's very, very different. But uh, yeah, it, it, your story of going into the military is, you know, a very common theme for people in terms of, you know, how it happens. And a lot of folks that don't join sometimes think there's some grand, you know, like a, a sky parts, you know, and, and a beam of light comes down and, you know, you see the American flag in the background and, you know, I'm going in. <laughs> but we all have very different reasons for why we decide to serve. So. But yeah, no, good story. And and and, and again, the, the fact that you were the the one guy left, that's that's kind of intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you, you're right, exactly. And, it, and there wasn't I, I didn't have a long term plan. In fact, um I when I got in and I found out what I was gonna be uh, gonna be a PJ or a pararescue man, what really got me going was doing civilian rescue. I was like, I'm gonna go out and do and rescue some civilians. I wasn't really into the whole combat thing. Um and you know i just never saw myself in that capacity growing up um and then as i entered into the career field and on my first deployment that actually that combat became somewhat of an addiction um to go out and and, and get into firefights and things like that um, so which led to the rest of my deployments and the pathway of my career all right yeah which and again for i maybe it's just me but i don't think so um in terms of, you know, the, the SEALs, right, and, and the Rangers, you know, Delta Force, you see, you know, you see it in the movies, you know, you, you see it in the headlines. But when you go back and think, oh, the Air Force, or, what are those guys doing? You know, if you think of, you know, fast jets and, you know, satellites and, you know, high tech stuff, and a lot of folks just don't think or even really know what what you do in that field and how specialized it is and that it's elite, just like these other organizations. So uh, yeah, it's about your, your time in service. Let, let's, uh, let's, let's talk a bit about that. Uh, Cause I, I, you've got a very compelling story here and, you know, quite, quite frankly, it's a, it's a tough story uh, to, as a person listening, right? So it's a tough story to, to listen to because it's 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 very emotional, uh, but it's so compelling in how you tell it 
and then even though there's tragedy in the end and as we're talking today there's goodness that has come from this and a lot of times when we're in difficult spots in our life depending on what happens to us uh, and, and it can be very bad sometimes we think we're kind of coming to the end of our story or you know but things happen and you meet people and folks reach out and help and then you find more strength and and that's what your story tells me and, and it's such an amazing story so if, if you don't mind Stephen, if, if we can just you know kind of start getting into to that part of your story and because uh, I, I really want folks to to hear this. Yeah, so I um, started, I started, I joined the Air Force in 05. Um, and again, went to the INDOC, which INDOC was a 12 week course. Um, we started with 120, finished with 12. And you finish that and you're like, man, I reached it, but you haven't done anything yet because I still have to go to airborne, I had to go to free fall, I had to go to dive school, survival school, um, underwater survival. Um, then I had to do EMT basic, EMT paramedic, and then our PJ schoolhouse um, training. So it's, it's a lot um, that we had to do, and it totaled up to be a two and a half years to get through that whole training pipeline. Um, so That's a long time. Wow. A lot of training. Yeah. Finished in 2008 and got uh, sent to or stationed in Okinawa, Japan. Uh, spent three years at a special tactics squadron out there where I um, deployed. Um, to Afghanistan in 2010, um, spent uh, four and a half months out there in, in Eastern Afghanistan, um, where you know, that's when that first bit of combat and getting shot at was um, kind of instilled in me and, and like, oh, okay, well, first off, I've never had somebody try to kill me. And now somebody was looking at, through a, well, looking down another gun, shooting at me and trying to kill me. And that was uh, a very big adrenaline rush and, and then, getting to know team members of mine and then them getting killed in combat. Um, so experiencing all of those things all at the same time in, in that first deployment. Um, so it was a very busy one um, for us. I left um, Okinawa, Japan in 2011. Um, and that was right before that. Um, there was the um, earthquake and the tsunami that hit mainland Japan. Um, so I went and did a bunch of uh, rescue and recovery efforts out there. Um, in March of 2011. Um, so getting some more experience and some more um, unique opportunities that, that normally people don't get and starting to really discover that I felt like I had a black cloud of doom surrounding me. Um, mm -hmm. And so left there and got sent to uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. So I was stationed in, at Nellis Air Force Base mm -hmm. for three years. Um, and so I took over a team as the team leader. Um, and this was a rescue squadron. So we deploy as um, a team um, overseas, a team of PJs and, and combat rescue officers, um, pretty much almost like a mobile fire truck inside of a helicopter. Um, so we are waiting on a call. Um, a call would come down um, from whatever incident happened as a point of injury. It could be an IED, it could be a firefight, a gunshot, a, a downed helicopter, it could have been anything. Or, could have been a scorpion sting, you know, any, any sort of injury that takes place outside of the wire. Um, we get a call, um, we fly out to whatever that is, um, and then go assess, pick up the patients or pick up the, the injured and then take them to a hospital. Um, and so some of those resulted in you know, mass casualties or high, house born IEDs, and you have six or unknown amount of patients, um, helicopter crashes, just, just the mix. So this was in, I've deployed several times doing that in 2012, 2013 to Afghanistan um, and got a lot of experience running about six missions a day um, over periods of four to six months. Um, wow. And so, yeah, so then that's when I kind of started to get the TBIs and some of the, what I didn't really think was PTSD at the time. Um, those symptoms started to develop. Um, as I started to get, continue with that adrenaline rush of deploying. Um, I saw those deployments, those rescue deployments were dissipating because they were starting to close down some of the bases that we were deploying to. And I still wanted to deploy, I still wanted to be in the fight. So that's when I assessed and went to our tier one unit um, in North Carolina um, and that's the 24th STS. And so 
that one. There's a whole nother selection pipeline or selection course. So you show up, you do a 14 day selection. So it's an, at this time, it's a bunch of experienced individuals in your career field going and being assessed and judged to now join the ranks of these folks. Um, so there's 15 of us that started that one, that selection course, and there was only six of us that got picked up for that in that particular group. Um, and so once you get picked up, then you start what's called green team um, or operators training course. And you spend about almost another year of training, only this time it's training at a tier one level. Um, so you're doing hostage rescues, flying in different types of helicopters, um, doing high value target assaults, and just operating at, at the highest level. Um, so we typically would deploy, we would deploy with um, the Army and the Navy's tier one units, so Delta and SEAL Team 6. So not very well known, but there are PJs and controllers with them on all of their ops. Um, so that's what I got attached to. Once I finished Green Team, I spent the last eight years of my career attaching to those units and deploying with them and doing hostage rescues or uh, high value targets or uh, fighting different counter-terrorist activities and things like that. So deployed a total of 10 times across Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, uh, East Africa. Well, wow, that, that's huge. I mean, I mean <laughs> did you track how many, you know, uh, frequent flyer miles you racked up uh, <laughs> during that time? It sounds like you spent a lot of time in the air, uh, you know, going back and forth uh, numerous times a day. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of, a lot of air time. I, I uh, Definitely, I'm not. I'm happy that I don't fly around in a helicopter anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, as as a marine, I you know had my share of time in, in helicopters, and I I distinctly remember uh, leaving Iraq back in um, 2003. I was with 15th Marine, uh, you know, uh, 15th MUSOC, and I was the XO for my unit, and I left a couple about uh, about two weeks early. To get back on the ship to inform the ship's captain, hey, we're, we're going to be knocking on your door here in about two weeks, so we got to start, you know, kicking things off to do a, a retrograde and, and get all our gear back on, you know, amphibious shipping. And so, but I remember flying out at like, you know, a couple of what seemed like maybe ten feet above the ground. It was probably at least twenty, but uh, on a CH forty six, just cruising, you know, at max speed. Uh, with the back end down, and so you know the sun was setting, and I could, I was the only one on the only one on the helicopter because they came to get me. I, I, it, it was the end of their day, and they were just taking me back into uh, Kuwait so I can again get back on shipping. And I remember it was a eerie feeling being the only person on the helicopter that low, cruising through the desert, this you know kind of hoping, geez, I, I hope it's not someone's lucky day today, you know. <laughs> that uh, you know might want to take down this you know lone 46 out in the middle of the desert but yeah uh, so you know Stephen you you breathed a lot of rarefied air in what you did and I can imagine how just life could probably seem to be very without that would this it would be like driving a Ferrari and then you're done and you, and you go in the parking lot and you've got a you know VW bug that uh, <laughs> that you're going to hop into just that you know the difference in, in in what your daily task and what you go through in in life you know going that fast and then it all slowing down and trying to process those things i i i would imagine that's very difficult yeah i i think um when it happened um is when is with the accident that happened um and that's i was ready for it to slow down and and it was a much needed thing for me um to to take a break and take a step back and and there's even now i mean there's always itches of seeing some of, or talking to some of my buddies out here and, and seeing the great things that they're doing and but also knowing that i've scratched just about every single one of those itches and i don't need to put myself in harm's way um right. anyway. Because I've already, I've already done that. Well, you know, the other thing, Stephen, in, in saying that is, you know, I think a lot of veterans feel like they didn't do enough, you know, and listening to your story, you know, a, a summarized story, you I, absolutely, you, you, 
you didn't leave anything on the field, right? You were constantly out doing missions and, and being successful. And even folks like you probably, you know, you said you scratched all those issues, but I'm sure that you feel and, you know, that you could go out there and, and probably do it again. And like you said, you, you know, get that urge. Um, a, a lot of folks feel that they didn't do enough. And, and I, I feel for the folks that served and didn't go to combat for whatever reason, right? And then they they doubt their service or they feel like, you know, hey, I, 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 I could have or I should have done more. And then they have this guilt complex. Um, you know, not everybody, but I've come across a lot of veterans that feel that way. And and that that bothers me because, you know, you don't necessarily choose what you're doing in the military. You know, some folks are fortunate and, you know, they built a, a path to go down. Um, but the vast majority of us, you know, we go to our next duty station and we do the things that we do at that time. And sometimes you just don't go to the fight or you go to a different part of the fight. And so, and that's another thing that uh, people will struggle with. Not that I'm saying that you do, but just, you know, as we're talking here in our conversation, and I, I always think about those folks that, that, uh, that, you know, have reservations about the time and wish they could do more. Yeah. And you see it a lot in my career field in particular. Um, in, in my eyes, I was never, I never wanted anything bad to happen, but if, and when things did happen, I wanted to be the one to go solve the problem. Um, right. some, one of my other buddies he, he who's, who's in this area with me, him and I have spent pretty much our entire careers together. We both went to Okinawa together. We both went to Nellis Air Force Base together and we both came out over here together. But our wow. careers are completely different where I was deployed to Afghanistan. He went to Africa and, and didn't really get any missions. He went to Italy and Greece on some of his deployments or Turkey or something like that. And um, his experience was very much different than mine um, as far as combat. Um, he, did, he did do some things in combat, but certainly um, he just always happened to not be in the right place at the right time. It was always on a team that just their deployment cycle was completely different. And like now, right now, a lot of those teams, especially the rescue uh, or white side PJs and, and rescue communities aren't deploying. And you have young, young individuals that really saw what we were doing back then. And that pumped them up and wanted, wanted them to get out there. And now, like you said, they're a Ferrari sitting in a garage and their time is only so much. They only have so much time in this period, once it starts, um, you know, if they make enough rank, they're just not going to deploy it. Yeah, they don't get to scratch that itch. Uh, and, and I don't, right. I don't, um, I try to, I understand what they're saying um, and what they want out of it, but it's not always so glorious um, you know, because you can, you can get addicted to the combat and it's, and sometimes it does, did feel like a video game at times, um, hunting, hunting bad guys until yeah. your friend gets shot next to you or something like that happens. And, and now it's not so glorifying anymore. It's not so great and wonderful. Yeah. You know, Stephen, I, um, when, again, uh, when I was with the 15th Mew, uh, you know, the first day of the war, you know, where it's like two in the morning and we're, we're pushing forward going across the line of departure. And uh, we have somebody, you know, the, the Mew commander, Colonel, one of his staff guys comes into our, you know, my units uh, op section, you know, into our COC and says, hey, the uh, CO said he wants to see you and your boss right now. You know, and here again, we're moving out. So we go in and he's like, hey, Chris, my boss, he, uh, the new commander says, hey, Chris, uh, a, a CH-46 went down. Uh, it's not far from where we are right now. We need to see we need to send someone on a rescue mission. You know, and here we are again, the entire force is moving forward. So he tasked my boss for that. And he, we came back and he was just like, I said, you know, I said, I'll go. You know, I was the XO. I didn't have a specific task other than, you know, kind of making sure that things are moving the right way as an, as an XO, as you're you know, doing your job. I said, I'll go, I'll get it. I'll get a couple engineers, you know, I'll get some corpsmen, get some security and uh, we'll, we'll go do what we can do. And so my expectation, my hope was that we'd roll up and, you know, we, we'd find them. It would be, you know, in a relatively secure area, you know, not taking fire and that we can save some folks and we get there. And 
there's just nothing left. You know, uh, it was it was the helicopter was just disintegrated and no one survived. And it was it was a really hard scene. And, you know, you can imagine, I mean, you know, you know what happens when helicopters go down and it went right into the deck uh, at max uh, speed. And, you know, over the years uh, that really it, 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 it bothers me, you know, because I mean, obviously there's nothing we could do. Right. What happened, happened. But the intent was to go save your fellow Marines and you know, to give, you know, to rescue and give aid. And I, I, I'm sure that you probably have stories in, in no, you know, folks in your field that that's that's what you guys see so much. I mean, I, I just that would be over time, that would be very uh, degrading on your soul. And, you know, being able to keep that separate from staying focused on what's important and not missing things and having your head on a swivel and not being distracted because you're, you know, fighting these demons and things that that you might be struggling with. I, I can only imagine uh, how folks in your community, uh, how that's something they, they absolutely, you know, have to fight. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, I, I was... On my first deployment, first and second deployment, there wasn't really Skype or FaceTime or anything like that. There was sat phones. And so that was the only way I had to communicate back home was in Iridium sat phone. And so there'd be times <laughs> of, you know, two weeks at a time or, or a week and a half that, you know, my wife, my family wouldn't hear from me. Um, and, but it allowed me to be focused on what was happening there. Fast forward to a, a 2013 deployment when now I'm thankful that we had FaceTime or Skype and be able to Skype and see um, my son um, and, and talk to them and um, see, see my wife and talk to her. But then there's the counter point of in the middle of talking to her is when I get a scramble call, which the scramble call means, all right, something bad has happened and go get on the helicopter to fly. And so we're in the middle of having some sort of interaction with my son i get the scramble call have to be off the ground in 10 minutes with a plan um on what we were going to do next and, and then go do whatever it was let's say it's multiple amputees or, or a mass casualty which which happened several times come back and then try to re re-enter that conversation that i was just having um was not something i wanted to do and it was and it was hard to just even call them back and say, yeah, okay, let's, let's go back to our conversation. Like there, there was none of that. And then it created a little bit of a wedge of like, well, they don't want to talk or he doesn't want to talk to them and stuff like that. <laughs> Sorry, my daughters. Oh no, I, I saw that sweet little arm. So you're all good, man. <laughs> Um, it, it definitely takes a toll and, and, and it showed in 2019 when, when I started to identify that um, there were some issues um, that I thought was from a TBI. Right. Yeah, that's so, uh, hey, God bless you, man. I, I, and it's no problem, your daughter's there. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I, I'm a dad of two, two daughters, of course, they're older now. But uh, yeah, I, I couldn't imagine doing this you know, back then, because they were all, you know, I wouldn't have gotten any of this done, <laughs> but it's all good. You know? <laughs> so Scott, well, I, uh, I would point out a couple of things. Hey, hey, Paul, uh, if, right. if, if, I'm sorry, if, if, if you don't mind, if we can save that to the, to the end, you know, once, once we get Understood. through the interview, then yeah, we'll, we'll do the Q&A at the end. I appreciate all it, brother. Right. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So um, anyhow, um, yeah, so now if, if we can, uh, Stephen, uh, let's let's shift gears and uh, you know if, if you can share with us uh, the you know tragedy that that came about and it kind of shifted uh, your life and your career um, um, and and without you know uh, and, and this is hard for me because it's, it's a tough story so I, I'm just going to stop talking and and turn it over to you and and ask that you you know share that part of your story with us. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so like I said, is in 2019 I started to like really um, identify some symptoms that that I thought were from TBIs. I'd see people I've known for a long period of time for 10 years, and I just didn't remember their name. I couldn't remember how I knew them. I just recognized them, and and it was 
embarrassing to a point where I, I didn't go talk to them because I should know who they are and I shouldn't know their name, but I, I just avoided them so that I just didn't have to face, hey, I don't remember how I know you. I just know you. Um, right. And then it would dawn on me maybe the next day or several hours later of, oh, that's who that is. And that's how I know them. And so I, at our units, especially the tier one units, we had um, so we have some pretty robust staff of human performance specialists. So strength conditioning coaches, nutritionists, dietitians, um, and psychologists really all working, functioning together to keep us operating at a high level. I went to our psychologists and said, hey, can I get like an MRI and some, and some testing done on why I can't remember who people are? And so we did some in-depth cognitive testing, did an MRI, and they're like, well, you, your brain is actually fine and you're functioning at above average and superior in all, all aspects except for one area, which is attentiveness, and you get distracted really easily. Um, and that's pretty uh, indicative of severe PTSD. You can't focus on anything um, that's going on right now. Um, and so I de denied that I had that. I declined it and said, no, I think it's from TBIs and you're, and you're wrong, um, essentially kind right. of thing. So. Um, it wasn't until one day that my wife had sat me down and said, um, hey, this is going to be really hard for you to hear, but your two boys are scared of you. Um, and so that was a kick in the gut of when, when she said that to me. And, um, so I mm -hmm. decided I went back to the psychologist and said, hey, what do people come to you about with PTSD? Because I don't have those symptoms that you see in the, th in the movies and, and the TV. Like, I don't wake up wanting to fight something in the middle of the night like i don't i'm not having these ter these night terrors and things like that right. um, and so started to discuss some of the symptoms um some of the things that i had been through and whatnot and identified that i did have sleep disorders i did have some pretty severe anxiety i did have depression uh, irritability was was high um i clearly couldn't remember things and i was having a reoccurring dream which was essentially a nightmare um, it was just every, almost every single night have the same exact dream. Um, and then I also didn't enjoy doing my job anymore. I was still really good at it. I just dreaded it every single time I went into work. Uh, and so after working on those things for several months and, you know, between May and September of 2019, um, I, I started to really come back to who I was and, and where I was and enjoy my job again. I was a team leader of my group of guys. There's three PJs and three controllers within my team. Um, we went out to Boise, Idaho to do a um, little morale trip to do some rock climbing and some mountain rescue. And we had just come back from the deployment. We're getting ready to, to enter our alert cycle. Um, and so when we deploy, we go off with different groups. So we're kind of singletons um, in our different areas. And so this is really coming back together building our team back up, figuring out who we are again. Um, and, and then we get to enter this alert cycle. So on this trip, um, we, we spent the days climbing and first day went really, really well. Um, next day, we also just as good, uh, finished up our last climb of the day. And I was ready to clean things up as I was cleaning up with one of our combat controllers. I wanted to call it a day, it was like 3.30 turned the corner and one of our guys was already halfway up one of the cliff sides and I was like dang it like, we got to do one more climb um, and so I said hey what's the plan um, he said we're all going to climb this this face we'll get to the top and we'll pedal down just like we did yesterday I said okay it should take like 30 30 to 40 minutes to get everybody up there it's it's not too high it's about a 70 foot face um, as we started climbing up one of our guys sets up a rappel line next to or adjacent to where we were climbing and I was like, oh, good, that's going to go even faster. So as soon as we get up, we just rappel back down. Um, so our first guy rappels down as I'm climbing up, uh, get to the top and start doing some instruction with one of our younger PJs or newer PJs onto the team um, of how I like to set up anchors and tie knots and, and make sure things are good to go. Um, our second guy starts his rappel and he gets um, about halfway down. Um, and then you can kind of hear like a loud blast or like a loud crack. Um, this is, you know, about six feet from me. Um, and I turned around and could see rope zooming by. Um, and so he had gotten halfway down and the anchor, there was um, artificial protection that was placed into the rock. 
Um, so there was a cam and a, and a nut that was inside there. Um, mm -hmm. The rock around one of those pieces shattered and then it shifted, shock loaded the other one and that other one shattered as well. Um, and so the whole anchor came free and the rope went along with it. So he fell about 30 or so feet, um, hitting some of the rocks down below, um, which kind of slowed his, his fall. Um, but our training um, to keep safe as we tie in to the very top, to that anchor, um, in case you slip and fall, like something's there holding you up. Um, so one of our other guys, Peter, was up and he was tied to that anchor. So the weight of the one that fell um, pulled, the, pulled Peter off of the very top. So mm -hmm. he fell along with a rope that I saw going by me. I also saw Peter holding back and trying to keep himself up onto the cliff and, you know, going, I'll never forget, you know, him going, whoa, 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 as he's going towards the edge. Um, and he got to the edge and then got whipped off. Um, and so mm -hmm. he got launched off the cliff. Um, I could see him looking down at where he wanted to land um, and then flip over um, where the cliff was. There was probably about 20 feet of space of walking, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, and then there was a steep slope. Um, and it looked like he wanted to land on that slope and roll down. Um, that way it absorb a little bit of more, a little bit of the impact. Right. Um, he didn't make it to that slope um, and he flipped over and landed right onto his back on top of a stone at the edge mm -hmm. of that slope and then bounced over to his face. Um, and so I watched him flip over, I watched him land and then I heard um, just it sounded like the wind get knocked out of him and I'm groaning at the end. Um, and the guy that was up there with me or the other PJ up, up there with me um, kind of screaming his name going screaming for Peter and whatnot and so right. told our guys at the bottom hey call 911 check to see if he's got a pulse and breathing and they check and he's got a pulse and he's breathing I, I'm already still tied into the rope that I just climbed up and so I set up my rappel and got down to him um, when I got down to him I felt to see if he had a pulse and listened to see if he was breathing and he didn't have either um, rolled him over to check again uh, when I rolled him over I could feel he had a broken neck um, he had a broken arm, um, a gash on his face, clearly had a broken back. Um, and so checks to feel um, if he was breathing and if he had heart, heart rate again and nothing. Um, so we started CPR. At that time is when one, one of our other guys, that, the other one that was up there with me, he rappelled down and got his med kit, brought it over to me. Um, and then I started to try to innovate. Uh, I didn't want to manipulate his head too much because uh, I knew he had a broken neck. Um, so I could, but I couldn't visualize the tube going into the cords. Um, so I attempted twice and both of them, I couldn't guarantee that it was in his, in his trachea. So uh, I needed to make sure that it was there, uh, that it was a good placement. So I opted to go with a crike um, uh, surgical intervention. So put in a crike tube, cut a hole in his neck, put a tube in there um, and, and secured that. And then our other, the other medic that was there with me, he did a field chest tube just without the tube. Um, so he cut a hole in his left side um, and then drained the blood out of, his, out of the left side of his um, chest wall. Um, right. And so about a liter of blood came out of his, his um, chest space or his, his lung space there. And then we closed that back up. I didn't have blood to replace there. Um, so I didn't want to keep it open and let him continue bleeding out. Uh, and at the same time, I'm talking with dispatch and asking them, hey, do you, they have a life flight and can they get a life flight here? Um, and to let them know that the fire department and the police department keep driving by um, down below us because they can't see where we're at. Um, so trying to tell them, talk them onto where they are at. Um, the life flight didn't have a hoist. Um, and when I found that out, um, that's kind of when I started losing hope that we could get him back. Um, and finally, after about 25 minutes or 20 minutes or so, the fire department was able to park um, and get up to where we, where we are. Um, and then that's when they kind of they put on the pads. They gave me a suction. I suctioned out his airway. Um, and when they put on pads to get a reading on what his heart rhythm was, I knew what it was going to be. Um, and so I asked the other guys that were with me to go stand over on the, away from him and to start cleaning up some of the gear. Um, because I didn't want them to see what it was going to be. 
Um, I knew it was just as soon as they see it, they knew it was just all hope was lost and going to be final. And so um, they put the pads on and it came up with systole, so the flat line, and um, asked them to check again. Um, they changed the pulled the cords out, turned off the the uh, monitor and plugged it back in and checked again and it was a systole again and that was kind of the few moments that I gave myself of like this actually happened this this is for real and um, I had lost 15 other teammates before my past but they were all in combat I was mentally prepared for it we were, we were all mentally prepared to to lose our lives overseas um, this one was very different we were out there training it was a morale trip um, his wife um, you know, he was going to have a conversation with his wife that night. His, he had a, a one and a half year old. Um, his wife was eight months pregnant at the time. Um, mm. So all of those things were going through my head of the notification, like what that notification process is going to look like when we bring him back to North Carolina, pulling him off of the plane, uh, the memorial, the funeral all of those things kind of went through my head. And then more so when I get back to North Carolina, I'm going to have to face the entire squadron. The entire squadron is going to see me and see me as a failure and, and blame me. Um, and I wanted them to blame me. And I felt like it was my fault. So I got up and I made the phone call to my boss and let him know that what had just happened. Um, we put him in a body bag um, and put a flag on his body. Um, and that's something we typically do downrange. And after I put the flag on him and we got him in the mortuary affairs van, called my boss and said, hey, this is the last flag I'm going to pin on a teammate. Um, I, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. So stop there. Yes, yeah, Stephen, I, you know, I, I, I heard your story you know, a couple of times now and every, every time you tell it, it, it's, it's, it seems like I've had, haven't heard it before. Um, I, I, I couldn't imagine. And, you know, the fact, like you said, you were, you and your, your, your men were on a retreat for lack of a better word, right. It's time to kind of decompress and, you know, get back some of that stuff that you need to fill, you know, into your, again, your heart, mind, and soul. Uh, before you kind of come back to the reality of, you know, facing the things you do uh, with your careers and, and family, uh, and then to have something like this take place uh, in, in that environment where you're absolutely not prepared for the way it makes you feel. Because, you know, as you said, you were, you had that expectation going into combat or, you know, being, um, serving in, in your job, but not in a situation like that and yeah that I, I as you were talking about all the things that were going through your mind how overwhelming that must have felt uh you know all things considered uh that's and i i don't even recall whether i said this last time and, and i'm sure you've heard this many times but i you know that's um i'm i'm so sorry that that happened i mean that's not going to do anything for anybody but um uh, yeah, that's it's, it's a it's a tragedy, uh, but you know something. You know, as I said earlier, sometimes in life when things happen bad, you know, time goes by, and even as you're struggling through those times, there are things that you start to see, and there are other people that you meet, and things can begin to change, right? Uh, because you start to see things differently. You maybe approach life a, a little differently. And, and those things are, are so important. And I think the folks that know you, and I'm just kind of going off my, uh, <laughs> off my list of things to talk about. Uh, I didn't plan on saying this, but I would certainly imagine that people that know you, that care for you and love you for who you are, the man uh, you are, the husband, and father you are they you know they they do not you know think of you as oh this guy's you know he's a screwball or yeah you know he could have or should have or whatever uh I, i'm sure that you did everything that you do because that's who you are and 
things happen, you know, as bad as they are. And you know, people get hurt, people die in, in life. And uh, I just, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, yeah. I, I personally, I, I couldn't imagine going through through that, especially with someone who, who's a teammate, you know, as as close as you are to to those guys, uh, because you you you're eating, breathing, sleeping with those guys. Uh, so, anyhow. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it back to you because I'm starting to step on myself here. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I called and said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And, um, he said, well, let's talk about it when you get back to North Carolina. Um, obviously an, an accident investigation and safety investigation started. Um, and so I spent a better part of those several months, um, protecting the rest of my team and, and um, trying to make sure that this investigation goes smoothly, but, but that it doesn't, um, uh, they don't try to attack my team and, and uh, make sure that everybody else is doing well um, and, and to continue to try to lead them as best I could. But I pulled myself off a team um, when I got back to North Carolina to work on myself because, number one, I blamed myself. I was back into having nightmares, wasn't sleeping, um, depressed, anxious. Um, I didn't. Now I definitely didn't want to do my job. I didn't feel comfortable doing my job. And I felt like a failure um, completely. So I spent two and a half months or so really focusing on myself 100%. Um, and then after that time period, um, this is probably around, um, so the accident happened in October of 2019. Um, in the December of 2019, late December, um, I came back and took the team um, back over as the team leader. I felt good enough and the team wanted me to be back. Um, and, and I was ready to do it. Um, and so as soon as I got back within 24 hours of coming back as the team leader, I de we deployed on a no notice deployment. Uh, so I got a, a phone call at eight in the morning and we were out to go do a, a deployment and a mission set by noon that day. So hopped on an airplane, flew out overseas and then spent about two or three months, um, overseas. Um, and we were out there, did our mission, did what we needed to do. Um, and it was pretty uneventful, nobody got hurt. Um, and I started to regain my confidence as a leader again. Um, so I felt good, came back in February or March of 2020. And uh, we were getting ready to actually deploy in our deployment cycle, which is May. Um, so we had a couple months of like, take a little breather, start training up again for where we were gonna deploy to. Um, and then deploy. So in April, we had a good train up going on and um, the accident and safety investigations closed out. Um, and those investigations found exactly what we thought, um, that there's nothing we could do, do to change the outcome. There's nothing we could have done um, to prevent what happened. Um, and that if he had landed on an operating table, the, the injuries he sustained internally, um, he's, he would not have been able to survive those. So um, but the military wanted to hold somebody accountable for a loss of life and they held me accountable. Um, and so I was removed as my position as team leader. Um, and then I was also kicked out of the unit that I was um, at and I had worked so hard to be at. Um, so mm -hmm. I, like I said before, I had spent a bunch of time doing selection and the green team to be at this tier one organization. Um, and now I was given 30 days to leave. I get, I get 30 days to PCS and go to another unit. Um, and now I had a piece of paper saying it is my fault. I had a piece of paper that wrote down that this is my fault and that I'm going to be punished and I'm going to be sent somewhere else um, because of it. So my therapist, um, the psychologist, was not happy about that. She didn't know that that was going to happen. And um, if I was going to take that position or, or move to PCS, it was going to be back to Las Vegas. Um, that's the unit that they were giving me. Um, and that wasn't going to be um, good for my mental state. I've been stationed there before. There was a lot of bad influences there while, while I was there. And, and it was definitely a struggle for um, me and my um, relationship with my wife at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that was a recipe for disaster. Not to mention if I leave within those 30 days, I was going to lose the continuity of care I had. Um, 
I would have showed up to this new unit with no resources that were available because they didn't have the same resources that I have here. Um, and there would have been no context of why I was showing up. I was gonna show up there having been fired from a unit for this accident that they know I was involved in. Um, and I didn't have a drive. Now I, I didn't wanna do the job anymore. I didn't have confidence in myself. And again, back to being depressed, back to being anxious, back to sleep disorders, back to not wanting to do, to do anything. I don't wanna do the job at all. Um, so the only yeah, that, way- that was, a, that was a no win situation. I, I can I can see that, yeah. And so the only way to continue receiving the care that I was receiving was to pursue a medical retirement so that I could continue seeing the same therapist that I was seeing and, and control a little bit of what was happening in my life. Um, so- hey, Steve, Stephen, can I, can I ask a question? Uh, aside from your therapist and, you know, did anybody come alongside you leadership wise? Did anybody, you know, try to bring you through this, uh, help you in making the decision that you ultimately made? Um, yes. So I would say in the leadership um, sense, um, the squadron commander and the squadron senior list advisor at the 24th at the time, um, they had an opportunity to essentially do what was done to me fire me and, and release me. Um, but instead they protected me and said that there was nothing that I did wrong. Um, and they said that, um, that they were not going to go down that pathway from their boss. The boss told them that they're, that they, uh, he was, that they were to fire me and they said, no, that they're not going to do it. So because they didn't do that, they themselves also got fired. Um, so they were removed from their positions, um, and sent to other bases. And so, my senior list advisor also did exactly what I did, and he chose to medically retire um, and get out. Um, mm. So I'm super, super thankful and grateful for them because they they could have easily taken an easier path and gone out um, and and protected themselves, but instead they uh, mm. they chose to to go down with the ship. Um, which yeah. I was uh, they they had integrity, uh, which is something that is so important in, in what we do in service. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I chose to pursue that um, medical retirement, I didn't know what I was going to do next. I didn't know what the plan was. I didn't have a plan. Um, I just knew what I couldn't do. Um, and so um, started to look at what was life like on the outside. So I started contacting a few of my buddies that were already out and most most of them were like, yeah, it's old, the only way to continue getting the same care that you received um, while you were there is to piece it all together with different nonprofits and organizations that service veterans. Um, and that the VA is pretty notoriously bad for, for most of us, um, at least to, to what the caliber in our special operations co community are used to. Um, and so I thought, man, that's not gonna be an option for me. That's not gonna work out. Um, started doing a little bit of research um, and much, meanwhile, at the same time, COVID's ramping up. This is in 2020. Um, you're really seeing law enforcement getting a lot of news attention, attention in the media. Um, and my dad spent 30 years in law enforcement and um, him and I were pretty much exactly alike in our ages. You know, when, when I was a child and he, and he was my age now and, um, I mean, we were exactly the same person. And I thought uh, with the things that he saw and the things that he did, how would he, he probably would have um, utilized the resources that I had. Um, and, he, and he could have definitely, I mean, he needed the resources that I had now. And what, what would have been different if he did have those resources? How would he, especially now, now that he's um, in his 60s, um, and dealing with a lot of PTSD issues that he's never dealt with after a, a 30 year career in uh, gangs down in Tucson. Uh, so, yeah. And, and Steve, and I, and, and I, and I know where you're going with this too, to a degree, uh, folks that serve in our communities, uh, whether they're policemen, firefighters, you know, uh, rescue folks, they don't have the support that we as veterans have, you know, with the VA. You know, there's good and bad, certainly with the VA, but there there aren't this 
plethora of uh, service organizations, nonprofits that are turning inwards, focusing on these folks who are coming from service. They, it's very different for them. And yeah, you know, he didn't have, and a lot of them still don't have the resources that, that we do. Yeah. yeah. So I, I um, developed a relationship with a uh, company called Exos. I went to their uh, facility down in Florida uh, for a shoulder injury. They helped me rehab. Um, they, they have a program called the Eagle Funds where they send out SOCOM um, operators down for four weeks to go through essentially physical rehab and uh, get them back to duty. So I had shoulder surgery, went to rehab with them and it was just one of a really excellent experience one of my favorite experiences in the military and i thought man like if imagine if we took the concept that i leaned on so heavily in my career which is the human performance potif preservation of the force and family concept and exos if i took that and applied it to veterans who have currently gotten out and for first responders both law enforcement and firefighters what good that could do for some of these folks that don't realize that these things, that's something like that. It can be so helpful to somebody that myself I've used very quite a bit. My teammates, the guys on my team right now with, with my nonprofit leaned on them very heavily. Um, and then my teammates back at the 24th are all using them very heavily and, and the life-saving mm -hmm. things that, they, that, that can take place are you know, phenomenal. Oh, absolutely. And, and who would know better than the people that, you know, go through and uh, experience that firsthand, you know, and then, then you have a story to tell. Uh, whenever someone's doing something well, you want to talk about it. You want to let other folks know so that, you know, more people get the help that they need. And so, you know, this, as your story's evolving here, this is where, in, in my mind, this is where the Phoenix starts to rise, you know, and here comes your nonprofit, you know, Shields and Stripes, you know, it's, it's born through your, um, through your tragedy and through your healing and you realizing what you just said. And, and this is a part about you, Stephen, that I always find so instructful. And, you know, when you, when you look for the good in people, you could have taken all that goodness absorbed it and then moved on with your life and, you know, lived a, a life with your family doing whatever. But you look back and saw people like you that need help and you see there's a way forward. And so now that's what you're doing, right? You have formed um, Shields and Stripes and obviously you're not doing it by yourself. Uh, you've got a story here to tell as well. And, and I'm just, you know, just for the, uh, the sake of time, I'm kind of pushing to that because uh, I, I, I want to make sure we talk to what you're doing now with Shields and Stripe. Um, you know, the, the mission of your organization, you know, what are, the, what are the key things that you hold dear? What are the things that you're doing to help people like yourself? How are you doing it? And um, yeah, I know that certainly you've got a, a big event coming up uh, here soon. Uh, and you'll, you'll talk to that, I'm sure, as far as the uh, appreciation dinner. But yeah, let, let's hear about what you're doing now. And I just noticed like 30 minutes into this that you're wearing your uh, organizational uh, ball cap there. That's really cool. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, now my hat. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So I um, had the relationship with Exos and um, I know what works and what doesn't work. And now I have to find the team that, that will uh, help me put it all together. So this was an idea that I wanted to execute in 2024. Um, and as I started up an internship with, with Exos, actually, um, I asked one of the mentors that I was shadowing, um, hey, is this going to end up in a job? And he pretty much said, no, you just need to start doing what you said you're going to do, um, which is start this nonprofit. And so that was a kick in the butt to to get it going to sink or swim and uh so i started it up and last april um filed the paperwork with um jennifer dr jennifer byrne uh, met her through linkedin she has a, a, an outside company that um, services the same demographic in a telehealth um 
capacity. Um, and so she, uh, her and I just kind of joined forces and started that up um, as far as the process and then developing the team um, to join me and building this up. So um, essentially bringing in firefighters, police officers and veterans into an EXOS facility. Um, so we've got an agreement with them to use a couple of their facilities, um, one in Phoenix and one in Gulf Breeze, Florida. And they're gonna get four weeks of that in-person strength conditioning, the nutrition, physical therapy, um, and then mental health therapy in the afternoons, partnered with another nonprofit called The Healing Impact, and they provide the psychologists and the social workers that come out and do the, the uh, mental health or behavioral health therapy in the afternoons. Um, so when the individual goes through the program, they, they get an individualized meal made for them specific to their goals and their needs by this registered dietitian and the kitchen on staff there. Um, so when I'm eating my gas station breakfast burrito, they're eating this really <laughs> nice, awesome breakfast that I'm super jealous of. Um, and then Steve, they go, Steve you, you, dude, you, you need to get a t-shirt that says <laughs> gas station burrito. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're if you start selling teas, you gotta you gotta include that one. <laughs> we got some shirts. We do have some shirts. Um, and they uh, so yeah, then they go get a pre-workout um, drink that's made for them by specific to them uh, by an intern. They go do a workout with a strength conditioning coach based off of their injuries. They have a specific workout plan for them, and then they come back for a specific uh, post-workout shake that's made for them and their needs by another intern. And then they can either hop in a hot and cold plunge, a sauna, um, they'll get a massage once or twice a week, depending on the, the program um, at that time. And then they have some other recovery tools and modalities there along with physical therapy. And in the afternoon, they'll either do group or individual therapy with an occupational therapist and a psychologist. Um, and so usually starting their day at 7 a.m. and finishing at 3.30 p.m. Um, the first cohort we ran was in October um, of last year. I'm sorry, September of last year. Um, and that was a, a one week in person and three weeks of telehealth. Um, and so the telehealth portion, when they leave the facility there, we do another 12 weeks, or that's the goal is 12 weeks of telehealth therapies to apply um, the things that they learned in person at home to so bring in their family um, to help them understand exactly what they're going through and how to apply all the things that they learned both the, the workouts the nutrition the psychology the stress education all that stuff at home um, now that we're they're back to real life um, right so that first yeah, you one, know go for it yeah sorry Stephen. uh i I thought this was, you know, really cool when you told me this uh, a couple of weeks ago, the fact that you guys are bringing the family, you know, that component, because that's, I mean, that's where you live, right? <laughs> and bringing that into the equation is very helpful because it helps them with expectation management, you know, and, and what you're doing, what's the end state, how can I help, how can I support? Uh, I, I would imagine that, uh, you know, that's a, that, that should make a difference in helping people stay with the program and then moving forward having you know the consistency and the discipline to make these things part of who they are and, and living their life and even when you look at something as simple as the type of food that you eat you know the older you get the the more important that is i mean it's important anyhow but as you age eating the right foods help in so many ways i mean even just for you know clarity of mind uh, Aside from all the other benefits of you know physical uh, you know, conditioning and you know, making sure your body stays uh, you know well well lubed so to speak. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, um, exactly that. And so Jen, she she spearheaded that telehealth portion, and and it's become one of the most important pieces of our of our program. And so the one we did in September, this is a, a stair-stepped approach to, to scale exactly what we're trying to prove that we know works, but to the rest of the civilian population and the law enforcement and firefighters, because it's hard to say, hey, we're gonna, you're gonna give one of your folks to us for four weeks. Um, that's that's a hard, some that's something hard for them to bite off on and, sure. and buy into. 
Um, so we need to prove that our concept works. So we did the one week in person, three weeks at Telehealth. Really great success there with uh, with the folks that went through it. But it did show that there was just not enough time. We needed more time with them, um, both in person and telehealth. So we did it again in January of this year, um, and that uh, was doubled. So two weeks in person, six weeks to telehealth, um, and it was again. I, I believe we changed some lives there, um, but again, it wasn't long enough. So we are planning our next one for August out of the Phoenix, Arizona Exos, and that one's going to be three weeks in person with nine weeks of telehealth and so hopefully eventually getting to that four week and 12 week number that we anticipate to have um, right. one of the other reasons for scaling is because it costs money it costs a lot of money these um, folks they're staying we'll put them in a five-star resort hotel um, because we they're receiving world-class treatment out of a professional sports facility um, both with the coaches that are on staff there and with our therapists i need them to have that same experience in their leisure activities or back in the hotel room. So I, I can't really have them go back to a Motel 6 um, after getting this world-class treatment out of this world-class facility. Um, and that's almost just as healing. In fact, maybe more healing for them when they go back to the hotel and they go down sit in a hot tub and have a couple of drinks and develop a bond and a relationship with, with the people that they didn't know, um, but are going through this journey with them together. Right. Yeah, that's a mindset thing. Absolutely. You're, you know, you're, you're keeping that, you're keeping them at the same level. They're not dipping down, you know, they're staying on plane, which helps progress what you're, you know, trying to get done. And I, I, I like the, you know, the phased or the, uh, the way you guys are doing it, right? Because you don't know what you don't know. You, you have a plan, you start to execute the plan, you see things that, are, that work well, you see things that you could maybe do differently. And so you're building this as you're going forward and you're doing it smartly and that's that's another good sign you know you, you guys uh you might not know everything but as you learn it you're you're taking a look at it if it makes sense you build on it if not then you shift gears and and being agile like that is huge especially when you're a startup and if you're not agile as a startup you're, you're not gonna be around very long exactly yeah so we've we've each one of those cohorts, we've learned some lessons out of them and been able to adapt and, uh, and make it better every single time. So we've got a, a partnership with Therabody. Um, they provide Theraguns and, and uh, do a waveform um, vibrating balls um, for, their, for the athletes going through the program, which has just been fantastic. They've been outstanding to us and um, developing other partnerships along with it um, has been great. Um, several of our sponsors to help put people through the program um big fish foundation green beret foundation and a few others uh pro lift rigging have been able to sponsor a specific individuals to go through it um and so this next course is three weeks in person nine weeks of telehealth um it costs about fifteen thousand dollars to put somebody through it um and that covers their airfare their lodging all of their food um, and then the services that are provided. So they don't really have to pay for anything um, while they're there unless they want to do something on the weekend or something like that um, sure. out of their pocket. But other than that, all the services and airfare and everything is provided by us. Um, and we're fortunate to have a lot of these other sponsors um, believe in us and, and donate and pay for some of these athletes to go through the program. Yeah, well, that that's tremendous. You know, when when you can do all of that at, at no cost to the participants, yeah, that that says it all. You know, uh, some some organizations work differently, but I I think that also kind of gets back to who you are, uh, the integrity of 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 you and the folks that you're working with, uh, that you're putting them first uh, and for all the right reasons. That's that's good to hear. Yeah, and and it goes back to you know my initial reason of uh, joining the military, or, or well, more so special operations, because somebody told me I couldn't, um, <laughs> was the same reason that I really started up the nonprofit was because I kept getting, before I started this, I called a lot of other nonprofits to ask what they were doing different. What did they do? Or not what they were doing different, but how did they start up? What were the obstacles that they faced? What are the things that I should learn from them? in this environment and all of them were veteran service organization nonprofits um, and nine out of ten of them 
um, literally nine out of 10 told me to quit, to give up, to, to stop doing what I'm doing and that it's too hard, that the idea is stupid, that nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to give money to me for it. Um, I'm not going to be able to get a team together to do that kind of stuff. I should just either work for them or I should do something else. Um, mm. And so I, I stopped calling nonprofits. I stopped talking to them and I just did it um, to show them that I can do it and, and that it's worth it and that people will give money for this and um, that they just don't have the vision. They don't have the, the drive that I have. Who are these people to tell me that I can't do something or that I shouldn't do something? They have no clue who I am or what I've been through. Um, I've been told yeah. a lot of things that have been really hard that I shouldn't do it. And I did all of those things. Um, I'm usually told that I shouldn't do something by people who never tried it themselves or um, don't have the drive to do it themselves. Um, and that's just been a common theme. There's other organizations that do have phenomenal um, so that I do have great support from Big Fish Foundation, Big Sky Bravery. Of those nine, um, nine out of 10, Big Sky Bravery was um, the only one that was like, I will, let me help you out. Josh McCain said, let me help you get this going. I believe in what you want to do. How can I help you? Um, and so he sat with me and mentored me up to where we are now. And, and it's just been fantastic. You know, sometimes it just takes one, right, uh, of the many that there are. And, you know, how many times do you think Elon Musk uh, has heard pushback, right? <laughs> you know, he, he's a man of vision, uh, too. You know, obviously a different uh, different path, but it's the same thing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I try to encourage my team that, you know, nobody knows who they are. That, you know, don't listen to some of these naysayers because even now, even um, every day I get people to tell me that, you know, that we're not, we're not what they're looking for to kind of laugh at me or something like that. And it's just feel for me to, to keep going and, and to show them one day they'll be asking me um, to come attend some of their, their conferences and things like that. And, and uh, I will, because I want to help people. Um, yeah. So that's, that's what I look forward to um, and to continue to grow. So we've only started fundraising in, since August of last year. Um, and we've raised quite a bit um, in that to be able to pay for three cohorts. It's about $15,000 to put somebody through. Um, we've put 10 throughs already. Um, we've got another eight lined up. So um, wow. that's just been what I've been doing is try to fundraise as much as possible. Oh, I, I, I bet. And, and for what you're doing, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, there's a lot that goes into securing funds for a nonprofit uh, different ways to do it, but, um, and people will say, you know, it's, they'll say they'll support, but, you know, <laughs> it doesn't really, until it hits the bank, you know, it's like, uh, you know, good intentions or, or what they may be, but yeah, you know, something else with uh, nonprofits and just, I would say a startup in general is, you know, whoever those core folks are, you know, having that, those upfront discussions about alignment and purpose and making sure that everyone's clearly sees that and that you're going to the same objective and you know that you're making sure that everyone's on board with that because a lot of times you know that's the thing that can help drive you apart if there isn't that alignment and you know not that you have to see everything the same way on every issue but that you understand the core objective and and the mission and everyone's you know good with that uh i, I in my experience i've seen that as a a thing that causes folks to go their separate ways because there's not that alignment there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm fortunate that most of our, uh, it's hard to say that they don't support veterans and first responders. You don't see that too often. Um, <laughs> you know, so uh, depending yeah. on the children, I guess. Yeah. Well, uh, Hey, let's, let's quickly, uh, we're at about an hour and 20 minutes ish. Let, let's quickly talk about your uh, first annual hero's journey. Um, appreciation dinner it's happening uh here this next month and it's in raleigh north carolina so what can you share about that yeah so um i had the opportunity to partner up with another nonprofit called leaving legacies foundation and they uh helped us start something um to, to help run this, this appreciation dinner 
Um, they do this for other organizations and they are fortunate, we are fortunate enough to be selected by them um, to wow. run something for us. And so um, it'll be the 6th of May starting at 6 p.m. Um, and the goal is to raise funds or enough money to pay for the cohort in August. So our goal is to, to raise $100,000 out of this. Um, it's both a virtual and in person. So folks can make it in person out in Raleigh, North Carolina. There's a virtual option so you can watch uh, what we do um, on stage. And the purpose of this is to bring the alumni or the people that have already gone through the program on stage um, and to finally present them with an alumni gift um, that I've got for them. Um, so that only the folks who have gone through the program will have had this gift along with recognize the therapists who are going who are actually doing the work for these first responders and veterans in, uh, in our program. So I think it's important to highlight both our heroes who are actually on the ground doing the work and then our heroes behind the scenes, keeping them functioning with their family and mentally you know, while they're in the service and while they're out of the service. Um, it's important that everybody sees who those people are um, rather than celebrities on stage or people that have a lot of money. Um, I'm not really into celebrating how much money somebody has. What I'm in, interested in is who's doing the work for people. Um, and that's what I want to celebrate. So um, if you're in person, we've, we've got a raffle, we've got um, a silent auction and it's an open bar um, with some a dinner and dessert. Um, so a really good evening up until 10 p.m. Um, and then we've got a little bit of a, a performance, a musical performance by Max Flynn. Um, and then I'll go on stage and speak, say a few words along with uh, my co-founder, Jen, and uh, a few other speakers uh, will come up for the night. But it, it'll be really cool. We're gonna show some uh, video that nobody else has seen yet of the, of the most recent cohort. It's pretty powerful. Um, says some pretty hard things in there that I think a lot of people shy away from uh, sharing. Um, so I think it's important that they, if they, I think it's important people see that uh, vulnerability that normally people don't share. Um, and then I'm gonna share some parts of my story that I don't normally share um, up there. And hopefully we can, uh, if nothing else, put on a fantastic show and uh, raise some money for our next program. Yeah, it, well, it sounds incredible. It sounds uh, very fantastic. And this, you know, what you just talked about, you know, the the progression of, of the evening sounds uh, sounds great, and you know the awareness part is so important. You know, bringing awareness to the program, to the folks that go through it, and the folks that are the heavy lifters. Uh, you know, recognizing those folks. I mean, that just shows your leadership right there of you know building the evening the way you have it set out. And for for the folks that uh, that can't go and that would want to see it virtually, what do they have to do? Um, so you can go on to our uh, website <clears throat> and then there's an attend option. If you look at, at the events portion of our website, which is, I think you have to scroll all the way down to the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. And then it'll take you to a uh, link that'll go to our Give Smart page. Um, and then there's where you can um, either select a virtual option or an in-person option um, on there. So that's on our website at uh, www.shieldsandstripes.org. Um, as well as I think if you can look at our Instagram handle, there should be some information on there with a flyer. Um, or if you have LinkedIn, um, there's also um, information on there with our, our Shields and Stripes LinkedIn tag. Um, right. So plenty of ways to, to be able to find it and look it up. Um, if you can't find our website, just Google Shields and Stripes and we should pop right up. Um, no, it, it, it does. <laughs> and explore. Well, well, cool. So, uh, yeah, I, that's going to be a great evening. And uh, it, it's nice to be able to come together with folks and, you know, share in the goodness uh, that that is Shields and Stripes. So um, let me ask a, a, just one one last question. Uh, so looking down the road for your organization, uh, is there anything uh, anything you want to share with us? Any, you know, any news coming on any future events? Um, so we have the gala coming up and then, um, I am building up, uh, there are a couple speaking events. I'll be working with Deloitte to go out and speak with them on the 21st of July. And, oh, and, nice. um, and then, uh, I'll be going to a, uh, an event in Arlington, Texas. It's a softball classic 
um, which which is also another nonprofit that or another organization that's raising money for a couple nonprofits. So we'll be out there for that. And then if you are in the Southern Pines area of North Carolina, there's a pop-up in the Pines on the 1st of May that we'll be at. Um, so I, we've got a lot of events that we're just really sticking our, getting our fingers into, um, which is fantastic. It keeps me busy. Um, I think one important thing to highlight for us is, is meeting with different congressmen. Um, so we have um, some meetings coming up that will hopefully get us down the long range um, goal, which is actually or the long-term goal, which is receiving federal and state funding. Um, that would be ideal so that we don't have to rely on constant fundraising and donations. Um, we can receive the state funding and it'll be routine and constantly going. Um, that's the goal is to host four cohorts a year out of each facility. And we have four facilities that are open to us. So if we can get 16 cohorts a year, we can potentially get 160 veterans or first responders through our programs per year um, right. and affect those lives, not just the lives of those individuals that are going through the program, but their families as well. Um, so that's, that's yeah, that, yeah that, that, that's a great goal to have because, you know, having that constant flow, you know, you can begin to rely on the level, you know, you have an expectation of, you know, where and what you can do with that money. And yeah, and, and that's a very stressful part about the nonprofit is, having to go out and, you know, beat the deck for money. And, and not, every, not everyone's good at that. You know, there, there's a there's a bit of a skill to that as well. You know, telling a story and then being you know, persuasive that, hey, this is worth it. Uh, a lot goes into that. And now, well, where are the where are those uh, facilities again uh, you, that you were that you were referring to? Use are, uh, the two that we currently use is in Phoenix, Arizona, and then the other ones in Gulf Breeze, Florida. Um, there's another one out of San Diego, California, that's been offered to us um, to, to check out. And then there's another one in uh, Texas, I think, just outside of Austin um, that we, that's been offered to us. So uh, we'll, we're planning to do another cohort in October timeframe. Um, mm -hmm. And that one, we're planning to use Florida for that one as well. Right. Well, I mean, I, I'll say this, you probably already know it, uh, California and Texas have two of the largest, you know, veteran populations in the, in the states. So what, what better locations uh, than those two states? So that's good. Well, uh, Stephen, we're, we're at about an hour and, and 30 minutes uh, of time here that, that went by quickly. Your, your story is absolutely compelling. And, and the good news nature of this is, is just tremendous uh, that, again, you and the folks that you're working with are doing good things for the people who help make our way of life what it is. And it's been a tough past two years, I think, for everybody, you know, with, with COVID, certainly, and then, you know, the, how things have changed for our first responders um, and even the medical folks on the front lines, you know, all the things that they're going through, the unknown of about a year of you know what's happening with this COVID and all the stresses involved, and to have people like you and your crew that are plowing plowing forward in uncertainty to shape a destiny for people to get them back on the road to health that that triad right the mind body spirit and having the results that you guys are having I, I look forward to your success. And you know, helping in ways like this, bringing you on, and and you know, trying to get your message out to people—that's that's, that's a, a good thing to do. And so, I'm very happy that you could share your time with us today. Uh, and with that said, uh, do you have a couple minutes uh, if we have a couple questions for you? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, hopefully, we can get you plugged in to some of the folks that went through our program uh, before and uh, share some of their experiences and and uh, start feeding some of their stories uh, because they're, they're pretty incredible. Each, each oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'd be, we'd, we'd love to do that. And, you know, as you know, Sarah as well. So that's a, that's a big yes. <laughs> so let's see, I think we had Michelle and Paul uh, still on. Uh, Vaughn had to go. Uh, she, she's a fantastic gal. I know she would add a lot of good questions for you, but I, I know that uh, I know Paul and Michelle will probably do as well. So uh, Guys, are, are you uh, you up for questions or comments? Yeah, I did have a question for you. Um, so I'm going on about a year and a half of being out on a leave for workers' comp 
formally diagnosed with PTSD, is still working through everything. One of my hardest things I find myself trying to work through is the self-blame that this is my fault. And because I was the supervisor leading my team at the time of the incident, I felt that they were all like, I should be the one for them to blame. And I don't know how to work through that. So when I heard you talk about, you know, the, the tragic incident and how you were saying you want them to blame you, it's, you internalized it. Do you have any advice on how to work through that? Yes, um, I do. And so I, it goes into another pathway and that, that blame and that will never go away. Um, you know, at least for me, like I, I'll always feel like it's my fault, but then there's going to be a time where you can accept and move, move forward. And a little bit of that, I don't know how faithful you are. It comes with faith. Um, and I'll, I'll go down my pathway, um, and, and what, what worked for me. Um, and you know, you could take it, um, or leave it. Um, so Peter, when he died, um, I, I did, wasn't super close with him. He was actually on another team. Um, and he, so he was a guest on my team. So that's what was even more painful for me because he was on red team. I was on gold team. So I expected his team members, his teammates to look at me as if I, like I was the one babysitting him. I should have taken care of him. And now he's died under my watch. Um, and he was a big man of faith. He was very into spreading, spreading the gospel and everything. And for me, and throughout my career, I grew up Catholic. I grew up um, under believing. Um, and having gone through 10 deployments and watching some of the terrible things people do to each other in the name of religion, um, I lost that faith. And I didn't want anything to do with it. And I didn't believe in it. Um, at Peter's funeral, um, I was obviously a mess and I'm sitting in this church. Um, he being a man of God, he, there was a video that was played um, and it was him speaking. And so this is the first time I've heard his voice and seen his face since the accident. Um, and so this was terrible. This was hard for me to hear. Um, but the message of what he was saying um, was almost like he was speaking directly to me. And so what he was, what they displayed or what they showed was a video of him talking to his, his church, his congregation. And um, it was him and his experience with depression and self-blame because he was a student at Virginia Tech during the Virginia Tech massacre. And one of his friends, one of his close friends was killed in that massacre. And he was not there. And he felt like it was his responsibility to protect that individual or he could have done something to stop that if he had been there. Um, and so he was describing his pathway of depression and what he was dealing with and the blame he was dealing with. And it was exactly what I was experiencing at that very moment. And so it was almost a message directly from him telling me what I need to do to fix the things that were going on with me at the time and watching his family and how they carried themselves with such grace and listening to the story he told about um, a, a, some, some story in the Bible almost reinvigorated that pathway for me and so I went directly to one of my close friends and asked hey what tell me about what Peter was describing in, in this specific particular instance and um, what he believed in um, and as I started to read or listen to what my buddy who was a pastor was telling me it became more of I started to accept that I didn't have control of it um, and that um, it gave me peace and forgiveness of myself, um, that I didn't, I don't control everything. I don't control what happens to rock. I don't control what, who is standing where, um, I can do the best that I can at any moment, at any given time. And that's what I did at that moment. Um, so that gave me peace, um, knowing that that's what Peter believed in, um, and that I was following down that pathway. And, and just me even exploring that pathway 
is something that he, that's what he lived for. Uh, and so his family was super gracious that I even was exploring that. I don't know if that helps you. Um, and, and I hope it does. And if that opens up any doors for you, that's exactly what Peter wants out of all of this anyway. Um, that's really the, the big message that he would want to spread is how does, how does one accept, you know, come up with acceptance and forgiveness. Yeah, yes. I appreciate that. I really do. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's what helped, you know, cause all the therapy, all the, the stuff I did was great for symptoms, but right. personal forgiveness um, only came through faith. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stephen, I, I would say, you know, grace and forgiveness are absolutely important things in, in life, especially when we go through tragedy and when there's a, a loss and, you know, when people feel like they may be responsible, you know, and even if things are gone through like they were in your case and it was definitive, you know, it's still something that's hard to let go of. And the fact that yeah, I think things happen for a reason, you know, folks think what they want, but that is very interesting that a video that he did, you know, years ago or whatever that timeline was, that it was designed for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? I mean, think, think, think about that. I, I get chill bumps thinking about that mm -hmm. because of the person he was. And the message that he shared, absolutely, that was for you to hear. And that's allowing you to realize that there is forgiveness and you can let go as, as much as you can do that. You know, to open the door to go down that road, you know, grace and forgiveness in life is so fundamental to leading a good life. And if we can't do that for ourselves, then how can we do it for others? We have to, I think we really need to understand that. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a, thanks for sharing that. Uh, that's a good, good part of your story. And that was an excellent uh, question, Michelle. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and um, the one verse that um, my buddy, uh, Brandon, and I gave him essentially one chance, of what, like I needed something. Um, and so one piece that he gave me was from Romans 8, 28 and and that's um, the verse that I carry with me as far as um, all things working together for good. Um, and so that although something bad has happened, there is something good that can come out of this. And that's what I was seeking is, okay, something bad has happened. What good can I bring out of this incident that will not, not only help others, um, but also um, honor Peter in his loss and not only just affecting the lives of these people, but affecting what they potentially can believe in um, that's that's what mattered to him amen i mean there's redemption in, in that absolutely all right well thank you michelle um hey paul i, I know you had some uh, earlier you had a, a comment or uh, whatnot uh, what you got for us paul well i have several things um i made some notes so i wouldn't forget because as you know, I'm old. <laughs> but in, but if he but does know it, you know, somebody will remind me. Uh, well, and you're, you're a man of, of immense wisdom too, so we're 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 ready. <laughs> well, the first thing I would say, and just to lighten it up a little bit, if I had known that the Air Force provided frequent flyer miles, I would have never <laughs> joined the Navy. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a good one. I didn't know that until <laughs> Scott brought it up. <laughs> the, the second thing that struck me as being a little bit humorous was that when I, I, I've spent 13 years in university, and the last time I graduated was at Cal State Fullerton in, in um, Orange County. And at my graduation, the guy who was responsible for uh, veterans throughout the entire Cal State system, I think like 26 campuses or something, 
gets up and announces that I am the oldest graduate in the entire Cal State system. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I needed to be reminded of that. Thanks a lot, buddy. <laughs> and so when Scott and you were both talking about being in community college and having a bunch of old folks around, I was that guy. <laughs> Uh, but the, the next thing I want to share is a little more serious, and folks can take it or leave it. I'm, I'm, I don't proselytize, but I believe the greatest gift we've ever been given is that of salvation, and the second greatest gift we've ever been given, given is that of forgiveness. And, you know, we just celebrated Easter. Um, we were forgiven at the foot of the cross. And those are two very powerful things. But what I would suggest for M Michelle, and I'll just say it for purposes of this recording, is that you were a leader, you were a boss, you were responsible for the welfare of the people under you. And those are separate roles from your role as a leader. And the reason they're separate is because the principal role of a leader is to develop other leaders, to bring people up and not be afraid that they're going to take your job if they get promoted and you get left out in the weeds. Um, and that reminds me of the guy uh, in fact, it was um, Dr. Watson at IBM who had a vice president come into his office and he said, I just really made a terrible mistake and it cost the company $10 million and so I'm here to submit my res resignation. To which Dr. Watson said, why would I accept your resignation? I just spent $10 million teaching you a lesson. And I don't want my competitors to have the advantage of that. And so it's how you frame it. And you can frame it as either, yes, you're responsible for everything or the people who actually did what occurred had some responsibility. Certainly your job is a, as a leader and as a boss is to protect them to the extent that you're able to. And I tell you this both as a former sailor, but assigned to diplomatic intelligence, and as a former police officer. I have gone to, I, I, I was literally in front of the address when a call came out that a man was choking. I parked my unit in the middle of the street and ran up the stairs to his apartment and started by giving him the Heimlich maneuver. He had accidentally swallowed a chicken bone and he was choking on it. And I did CPR and I was on the radio at the same time calling for help and uh, to send the EMTs and the fire department out and all that. And the paramedic came to the door and I met him and that was 45 minutes after the call came out because they were on another call. It was a small town. And so I went out to meet the paramedic and I said, listen, the fact is this guy has expired. And I would appreciate it if you would put him in your ambulance and pronounce him en route to the hospital. And he looked at me and he said, why? And I said, because I don't want his wife to have to walk through the living room and every time she does, see where he died. Mm -hmm. And this guy said to me, what made you think of that? Or where did you learn that? I said, I didn't, it just showed up. And it did, literally. Mm -hmm. 
So that became policy in our department and then became policy in the county. Uh, you don't pronounce people necessarily at the scene if it's living quarters for the rest of the family. And this guy was 61 years old at the time and I was a young punk kid of 33 or whatever I was at the time I was a sergeant. And I don't know where that came from, but I do know that it showed up and that I needed to use it to help others. And I've spent most of my life helping other people. Um, and I'm, I don't say that boastfully, I say it because that's what I'm made up of and that's what I do. And, and so I would just share that notion with you that yes, there is salvation. Yes, there is forgiveness. And yes, you are a leader, a boss, a shepherd, if you will. And you, your job is to protect these people. And so that's where the notion of servant leadership comes in, where your job becomes one to raise the rest of the people around you as leaders. And that doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to touch this guy today and he's going to become a leader. It doesn't work that way. And, and so I, I share that with you for whatever it's worth. And I'll let it go with that. Thank you so much for what you're doing, though. I, I really appreciate that. And I just sent you a note on that. Oh, great. Thank you for sharing that. That's pretty powerful. I can't. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, pa Paul is a really, he's a truly amazing man. He's His life experience, uh, Sarah, uh, myself, and Paul, we live relatively close, you know, geographically. So we, we met for coffee geez, uh, about maybe a month and a half, two months ago, I've kind of lost track of time, but, you know, we, we probably spent three and a half hours easily, you know, just getting to know each other face to face and, you know, learning more about each other. And, and, uh, Paul, he, he's a good man. Uh, he, he has done so much and continues to do really good things for, uh, folks. Uh, some of it's behind the scenes stuff, but it's extremely impactful. And I'm, I'm sure if you guys talk, he'll probably share some of that with you as, as well. But okay, well, um, Stephen, I, I know you probably have a bunch of stuff that's stacked up waiting for you as soon as you get off the interview here. Uh, but I, I do, again, I, I thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for who you are, uh, uh, the folks that you're working with, uh, Jen as well. I know she's, uh, I think, in fact, I think she was talking with Sarah maybe as we're doing this interview. And, and I, I know she'll be coming on the power of our story as well. Uh, we look forward to, to you uh, talking with Sarah in that capacity. And as you mentioned, you know, the fine folks that are coming to your program uh, who want to share their story, they, they've got a, a place here and on the power of our story to do just that. So we look forward to, uh, to doing that here in the coming, coming weeks. So hey, uh, much success to uh, your organization, Shields and Stripes. And for a fun, very fun and successful time and outcome with your uh, dinner here on the 6th of May. And what I'll do, uh, Stephen, is you know, when we're done with uh, the, re the recording, which will be here in a minute, um, once it posts to the cloud, I will shoot it to you in raw form. Anything you want to do edit-wise, we'll, we'll make that happen. Uh, if not, we'll just go ahead and post it. Uh, to YouTube under the Power of Story with Sarah Carell. And then in the description portion, if there are links or you know any information that you want out there, uh, if you can just shoot that to us, uh, LinkedIn, DM, or email, whatever is best for you. And we'll make sure we incorporate that with the interview so folks that you know are, are watching can tap into that and see how to uh, connect with you, how to donate, or you know stuff like that. So, so we will do that. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. I'll send those to you um, as soon as I can.